Welcome to a new episode of the Dynasty Mind. We are having a morning edition today. We're having a little bit of a coffee and with none other than Matt Waldman, the writer of uh, Rookie Scouting Portfolio. Thank you so much, Matt, for coming on this show to talk about uh, your latest uh, Rookie Scouting Portfolio for the 2018 season. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. It's nice to be on again. Had a good time talking with you earlier this year and uh, looking forward to doing it again. Absolutely. The last time the I had received a lot of great feedback about digging into your process, people always wanted to dig into the minds of uh, uh, dynasty players or even just uh, the talent evaluators. Uh, and you of all, you're, you're. I don't know. I don't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't sense that you were trying to make a name for yourself in the beginning. But you know, you are one of the most well respected, and I continue to pour out praise for the work that you put in because uh, it, it really shows a the hard work that you put in, but also the love that you have for this game of football. And we're very fortunate to have this game for as long as we can. Well, thank you. You know, and it's certainly, I mean, it's, it's, it's just kind of a testament to that if you enjoy what you do and you, and you work hard at it, that it's something that, you know, I, I can't say that for every personality, but everybody has you know, a certain type of personality and my personality, I think was well made for finding something that I really love to do um, because I'd immerse myself fully into it. So it's worked out and I'm very fortunate that, you know, podcasters like yourself and, and other writers have, have enjoyed the RSP and helped me spread the word over the years. So it's great. Yeah, no, no, that's, it's really definitely uh, some, a valuable tool and, uh, let's talk about that. Let's dive into this RSP. So how did you come up with this idea of writing about, uh, man, I have to remember, your first RSP was... Uh, 2006, was, yeah. That was a lot of prospects, and it has only grown in its content and in your evaluation and all of that. So talk talk about a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I mean, I was living in Athens, Georgia at the time, and I was... You, you know, my story is kind of interesting. If you are someone who believes in personality types, um, you, you know, there are people who use personality types for hiring or for what they look at in certain things. And maybe contrary to how I come across sometimes on on radio or, or in podcasts, I'm what's called an INFP, which is a, a rare or personality type. It's kind of a very, I'm very introverted um, it's an intuitive, it's uh, introverted, intuitive feeling and perceptive. Those yeah. are the, those are, and usually that's reserved for therapists and artists and people of that nature who usually you find a lot of people in that, in those spheres of life who have that kind of personality type. So, you know, I was a musician way back in the day, um, studying to be a musician in, in Miami, Florida, and then <clears throat> excuse me. And then I realized that that was something that I wasn't sure I wanted to continue to do on the way that I was doing it. So I moved back to my home state of Georgia and decided that not knowing what I wanted to do with my life, that the University of Georgia at that time was the cheapest school that I could go to as a student and a re you know, resident there. And it, it made more sense to be able to explore some things there. So I explored a variety of things and one of the first things I did was um, journalism and I went to school, the journalism school and I happened to, you know, get a, a job, a paying job on the paper within about a week, which was kind of unheard of. And I was covering the football team during that time. And I, and within about a month I had this, um, we had a writing coach there who was a um, former sports illustrated writer who, who wrote, in the, for Sports Illustrated for about 12 to 15 years um, and was in New York doing that. And then he came down with his wife who was working at the, who ended up working at the university and he ended up working at the university as a magazine um, class teacher. And he graded, he graded writers at the, at the local paper. So he told me everything that I wanted to hear as a musician. He told me that as a writer. Um, and I had worked much harder as a musician. It kind of screwed me up and it, I wasn't sure about what I wanted to do. So I ended up leaving journalism. Um, you know, he was going to set me up with some 
nice or at least get me in the door to, to for me to work for some nice internships with some major papers over the summer but i just decided that i didn't want to do journalism and i left ended up getting an english degree and i was working part-time at a job selling children's books over the phone like oh. little golden books if you remember the little golden books oh, which I, I laugh because you hear my the tone of my voice and i think I, it's so funny i had to kind of change my voice a little bit to sell children's books because i just didn't come across very well but anyway the reason i tell you this backstory is that i um you know i had some journalism training and I ended up going into a part-time job that became a full-time job because that company was one of the oldest and largest telemarketing firms in the country. And it grew from being like a, a phone a, a phone job to being a supervisory role, to being a management role. And I was in school while I was doing this. And then it grew to the point where I had a full-time job and, and I bought a house in Athens and I had graduated from school. And I still didn't know what I really wanted to do, but it was it turned into a career where I ended up, you know, the, that company turned into doing call center work for inbound customer service. And one of our major clients was AOL, just as AOL was really starting to get off the ground. So I did a lot of work with them and I ended up becoming a director at that company, doing a lot of um, work with, you know, operations work and, um, you know, quality work. And I had to get some certification in terms of, you know, processes for how to monitor performance and how to institute that across a, a corporation. And part of that was to try and get a client and, um, you know, and a certain client that we were after. And some of it was also just to, to kind of stay up with the times and to try and make the company better. So I had learned how to, you know, create all these different monitoring processes. I taught myself how to use a database program and kind of use that to institute some information and remember a lot of this was early technology so it was you know it was before people started getting into technology companies to to create these things for businesses so a lot of it was kind of wild west stuff so you know i was doing all that and you know in my early to mid 30s i decided that i realized what i wanted to do and i had always wanted to do it which was to write and i had done some writing freelance throughout the year some of it was for that same sports illustrated writer and I was doing, I did some writing for, some copywriting for corporations, um, you know, and, and, and for some freelance work. I did some things for a lot of, you know, companies like including the Fountain Blue Hotel in, in Miami. And I did something for the Ritz Carlton in a, I put on a, I actually wrote a 30 minute performance narrative that they still, I hear they still use today. Um, that, that was um that's done on on a property that they do for um you know kind of a show that they do with actors and things like that so i you know i've, I've done a lot of different types of writing over the years just freelance and at one point i just realized that i really wanted to write for a living i was in my early to mid 30s you know my, this job was a good job but it was something that i had kind of just fallen into and I realized one day that I really wanted that I really wanted to do something that I enjoyed. And I, I was starting to play fantasy football back in, you know, the mid nineties, I started playing. And then I realized that maybe I could create a fantasy football website. And I was writing these articles called the gut check just for myself. Didn't show them to anybody. I wrote about four or five of them and I started in a dynasty league and um, through one of my closest friends. And I was told, you know, I met this guy named Mike McGregor, who is who is of FF Today and Draft Buddy. Um, and Mike and I were negotiating trades all the time in this league back in the early 2000s. And he liked how I wrote because we were doing it by email. And he said, you know, have you ever considered writing? And I said, as a matter of fact, I was thinking about starting a mock draft site that you could do your own picks with. This was back in like early 2000s. And I was trying to hook up with somebody to do that. And it wasn't working out all that well, but I had written these articles for content and I showed him my first like three gut check articles. He showed them to his partner and they were like, yeah, would you like to come on? And those were my first three articles of a, of a series that's, you know, I think I'm well into the three hundreds of, you know, or more of, of articles I've been doing. So the next year I thought I was listening to Gil Brandt talk about Brian Westbrook. Um, and, Actually, I was during that year. I was listening to him talk about Brian Westbrook because I wrote about Westbrook as my first 
as my first gut check. But I remember listening to him talk about Brian Westbrook and say, um, you know, if he were an inch taller and about 15 pounds, 10 to 15 pounds heavier, he'd be a top 10 pick in the draft. And I wondered why that was. And I started thinking about the fact that this was just like corporate America. You know, the same dynamics were there. It was like, you know, they're not going to evaluate purely on ability. They're going to evaluate on risk and risk factors that have to do with more than on the field, but also off the field. So what if I just, and I thought they're going to get these wrong because everyone gets those wrong. The, the soft skills of, you know, it, maybe you woke up the wrong side of the bed today and somebody asked a question to you and you didn't like it. And now you don't like that person as much as you like somebody else, or you like the bias of that. He's tall, blonde and, you know, and went to the same school as your, as your uncle, you know, I mean, there's like, I've seen crazy things like that happen. So or they, or that you don't have a cultural understanding about somebody, and you end up having a bias that's, you, you know, that shouldn't happen. So, I just thought it would be fun to to, to really study players just to, just based on the field and just remove all that stuff and maybe write about it and explain why I'm excluding it. And so, you know, about you know later that summer, I, I started. I, it was like I think that by that time, maybe a year or two later, I. Around 2005, I bought a TiVo, and at that time, I just started TiVoing as many games as I possibly could, and I remember thinking, I'm a little bit behind. It's like February, and I'm, I've only watched like, I don't know, 30 players, and this wasn't going to be a book, and this wasn't going to work out very well, so at the time, I, I took my TV, my TiVo, and my computer, and I... And I I told my family, I was like, I'm taking a week off. I'm going to a hotel and you can find me here. But I'm unless there's a, is this a good week for me to do this? Cause I need to do it sometime this month. And I'm, and they were like, yep. So I, I took the, I, I took a, went to a hotel like just outside of downtown Athens and just um, wrote the thing and watched probably about, I don't know, 40 to 50 players that week. I think I did about 120 plus hour work week and did nothing but bring takeout in or go to go out maybe once every few days to just get some sunlight and and just do and just work straight through and I thought I'm going to do this and if I I'm going to do this in a kind of a packed way and try and get it done just to see what it looks like and see how I feel about doing this work I figured if you know this is going I'm going to have a, a a a really intense session of this for a week It'll tell me if I really want to continue trying to do this or not. And I thought, I'm probably going to hate this by the time it's over. And this will be the last time I do it. And by the time I finished watching film, I was like, I love this. I absolutely love this. And I want to keep doing it. And, you know, it wasn't a big, I don't even remember how big it was. It, and it wasn't that great, you know. And But it was funny because, you know, when the draft came, I remember – you know, I think that was the year that Matt Leiner and Vince and Vince Young and Jay Cutler were in the draft. And I didn't like Matt Leiner. Everyone thought he was Tom Brady. I didn't like him that much. I liked Jay Cutler a lot. There was a back I liked by the name of Mike Bell, who I had ranked from Arizona, who I had ranked like sixth or fifth or somewhere in that range that was pretty high. And he didn't even get drafted. And I thought, well, what do I know? You know, I'm doing this. And he ended up becoming the starter for the Broncos that year as an undrafted free agent. Um, and he literally won it just on the merit of his talent. I don't think there was, I think there was one injury, but he ended up, you know, climbing over a couple of people and thinking, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'm on to something. I got a lot more to learn. So that's kind of, that's a long story about how it got started, but it was, you know, it was one of those deals where I kind of wanted to share that, you know, a lot of the writing came into that. Um, I ended up taking, uh, I ended up writing for that, um, for that editor at the university of Georgia as a features writer full time for a number of years for that same, that same writer. Um, you know, so it was kind of interesting how that kind of went or worked around and, and, you know, a lot of that goes into the work that I do is, is kind of writing in depth and talking about things that borrow from outside the, the sphere of football and trying to draw parallels between what I do and, or what football's like and the dynamics of the world outside of football and how they're in common. And, you know, back around 2011, I had a, 
an individual who has worked with several teams in the capacity literally full time for them in the capacity of scouting and also other areas um after that who who told me that he bought the book in as far back as 2007 he told me this in 2011 and said that you know he was like look you know i think you know this this there's scouts in the league who are way better than what you you were doing at that time and and there are still scouts that are better than what you do and i'm like yeah why would there not be and he's like but he said, your process is light years ahead of what the NFL is doing. And I can tell you that because I work with that type of thing. And he said, and on top of it, he goes, I never met anybody in the league, anyone who's never been in the league who had a better pinpoint of what the league is really like in terms of how they, their dynamics and their decision making um, than what I've seen read in your work. And, and, and we you know, had a relationship where we shared a lot more um, since then. But I found that fascinating because a lot of it I always speculated about. And then as as folks like him started coming out of the woodwork and kind of saying, I buy your work and, and kind of keep in touch, I've had, you know, people from a wide range of um, customer bases, you know, kind of buy this work. And that was one of them that I found very interesting because it was validating to have someone in the league basically say, you've got a really good idea what's going on here and it, it's not as crazy as it sounds um, or it's crazier than you actually think, you know, it's kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And that was a fantastic story. There's so many parts of it. I can relate to it. And I definitely would want to talk maybe offline after a little bit to talk more about that. Um, it's a lot of things that's packed in there, but uh, that has to be validating. You've kept it up after 2006, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, boom, 11. You finally hear from someone who can, who has been through the NFL, who understands the workings of scouting and evaluation. And just to hear that uh, probably um, gives you a sense that this is not just for fantasy. This is now uh, a work that can be applied to the NFL and we get to see it. And um, your work really does um, speak many volumes as to how impactful, how, how, um, how much uh, it translates to the NFL because I still consult the older RSPs just to see what have I missed about certain players and it, they're still there, they're performing and you know nobody else were talking about them. Everyone is um, pretty much gathered in looking at who is going to be drafted in the first round because but the NFL is seven rounds and then UDFAs, all those bases you did cover and it's continuing to expand. So coming into the 2018 year, what has been the biggest uh, evolution of your uh, RSP? Well, I think a lot of it's happening behind the scenes, but one of the things that kind of emerged from that, that you'll probably see more of in future years is I had, I had created a, a different ranking for running backs this year that is based on more third down oriented or pass oriented um, performance metrics. So it's, it's the same, information that I'm using to grade running backs for the depth of talent rankings I use, but I just altered the value, the point values of the, of the criteria so that I could see what it would look like if I, if I put less emphasis on running between the tackles and more emphasis on really blocking, catching and, you know, areas that may be more open to, you know, to the open field. So it was kind of like I diminished some slightly and gave more weight to others. And I I can see where that's going to be heading for me for wide receiver play, for tight end play, so that, you know, I can have, it's more about now looking at positions and understanding kind of what the NFL does. You know, the, when the NFL drafts or looks gets ready for its draft, they don't look at 70 wide receivers and rank 70 wide receivers. When they draft, they look at it and say, okay, what, you know, we have the X receiver, the split end, the Z receiver, the flanker, we have a slot receiver. We, we're looking for one of those three types. And maybe there's some cro that some intersection between some of those because some receivers can play two or all three of those roles. And they look for, and they narrow it down. So instead of looking at 70 guys, they may be looking at eight. So they look at eight guys and they're studying them and they've they've excluded a bunch of players already before they even get started because 
they don't need that on their roster. And if the guy so happens to be able to play three or four positions, all the better. But when some folks say, oh, how could they have passed over X? They weren't even looking at him. They weren't even looking at that player because he didn't fit what they needed at the time. And that makes sense because you have so many players to study. I understand why you got to prioritize that early. So I want to start doing more where I'm doing rankings based on different types of position roles. Um, and it may not be strictly, here's the X receivers, here's the Z receivers. It may be, but I'm thinking more along body prototypes or not so much body, but role prototypes where it's like, okay, here's a receive, here's receivers who, you know, kind of play a big slot role or a little slot role or, you know, red zone role or someone who's more of a deep threat and kind of do it in ways so that I'm pouring all my players through those um, measurements so that you can see them ranked in several different ways. So that if a team picks a player and says, we're going to use them in this role, you can take your rankings and look at it that way and see how that that's different. Differ. Same thing with tight end where, you know, for, for right now I rank it kind of on a broad cross section and so the move tight ends, the tight ends like the Jordan Reeds are still in the same categories as guys who may be more valued for their blocking um, than what Jordan Reed is valued for. And it's not really fair to either group because if you're watching more as a draft Nick and you're wanting to read as a draft Nick, you're going to look at Jordan Reed and say, yeah, he's valuable. But w what we need is a guy like Ryan Izzo of Florida State who can block really well he just is a short area pass receiver and you're not going to see him catch a lot of passes, you know, past the 15 yard level of the line of scrimmage. So just being able to specialize is, is one area where I'm really focusing on a little bit more because I think that that will help people understand to me rankings. I don't like how rankings are just so just linear and it's one size fits all because the NFL doesn't do that. And I don't think it's sophisticated enough for a fantasy owner who really wants to dive deep and understand, you know, who's good and why they're good as opposed to, you know, just this black and white one, two, three, four type of thing. Because even the even that you look at the rankings and I have a depth of talent score and I could have, you know, like this year's wide receiver class, I can have 24, 25 guys who I would say if they get land in the right spot, they can start right now and get production and they'll be good fantasy players. So if I have 25 guys like that, if the guy is ranked 22nd and, you know, intuitively you're going to look at the 22nd ranked player and go, why do you not like him so much? And I'm thinking, well, I don't like him as much as these other players, but all these players fit into this category because there's such a narrow um, difference between them grading wise for their ranking that really they all fit into the same tier. And that tier is they could start right away. They can contribute. They're good enough to be in the NFL and good enough to play. It just depends on what they need to develop. And th this guy at 22nd, and I'm talking about Cortland Sutton right now. This guy <laughs> could be, this guy could be, um, you know, helpful right away this year. But if he, but he has more areas than the guy he's narrowly, you know, behind, even though several, several rankings behind who I think will, you know, have fewer, make fewer mistakes when it comes to catching the football. And that, that difference seems sizable when it comes to a ranking, but when it comes to a tier, it's like that, you know? So it's that, that's the hard thing about rankings when you're doing something like this. And that is very, some, very much something that I've been trying to articulate over the last few years that how there's a short fall of rankings, but people still craze for rankings. And I, I would, I, I know tiering helps a little bit, but it doesn't always uh, capture the why, how you separate uh, certain players and why you put them that way. So I've been trying to uh, find a great way to articulate the idea of um, how we can uh, assess players, where they should be, and how to accurately portray them. I think you have done a fantastic job in this RSP. Now, um, you already talked a little bit about, you give us a little preview about what to expect. You have Cortland Sun ranked 22nd. Uh, but what can buyers, those who are unfamiliar with your work, what can they expect uh, when they purchase your guide? Sure, you know, and I'll give you a little bit of a tour of that, you know, right now, in fact, and we'll 
share the screen here and make sure that you can see it here. This is the, you know, this is what it looks like when you download it. What will happen is you'll go to my site, www.mattwaldman.com. You will pay um, uh, 19, excuse me, twenty one ninety five um, by PayPal. That's what I take. And I don't take any other form of payment just because it's, if I were having to track it down and log it and do different things with it, I'd never have time to watch the film that I watch. So it's, this is the most consistent way or efficient way. And you would get a, you, while you're buying it off of PayPal, it'll give you instructions on creating a login and password. Um, and once you've paid for it, sometimes depending on what type of credit card you use or debit card you use, it may take a, you know, a day or two to pass, but most time within like minutes, you can just log back into mattwaldman.com, use your login and password, and it'll give you a link to click on and download it. And this is what it's going to look like. It's a PDF. You can see it's huge, 1734 pages, and that seems overwhelming, but it's really, it's bookmarked in a way that you can see everything and it's really like a 400 page draft guide where I show all my work and you'll see that in a minute but you know you'll see here you'll get an intro that'll kind of tell you about you know how I grade you know what's the concept behind that what stack scores are about I have a glossary that you know that you can go to and it'll take you and it's bookmarked here too so that you can see you know how I define everything. This is my process laid open. You want to read more about balance. I define balance. I give you what the point values are for each position. So you understand how I'm grading it. Um, and so you, you can kind of, if you wanted to do evaluate players yourself using my system, you could do that based on what I've provided you here. That's that transparent. So, you know, I go through all of that information and then each chapter, you know, we look at quarterbacks and I give, you know, an overview. I talk about productivity at the position. Um, you know, I, I go by, you know, who's been drafted by round and talk about some history about that and some statistical information. I talk about my grading scale a little bit more and about the rankings and how I draft them and what's the difference between my pre-draft and post-draft rankings. So what you know to expect when I when the post draft comes out within about seven days of the NFL draft, and then I I take you through how I actually graded them in a sense because after I watch film and I'm writing down what I see and grading them on one checklist, I'm also then stack ranking them on another scoring scale, which is the depth of talent scale, and I just kind of it's uh, there's basically skill and stack ranking breakdowns, and I explain what I think are easier or more difficult fixes. And these are some things that I will probably be doing more with down the line um, when it comes to grading players. But what happens is that, you know, we're going to look at platform accuracy and I, I define what that that is, what are the ranges for, how I grade it, and then the point values that I give. And then there's, the, you know, I, I have a key that shows in terms of font, that where I give some bonuses to a player, you know, and the bonuses are basically a, a small percentage of each of these scores based on where they're stack ranked. And I don't give a high level. Like you may have a, if we were talking about a, a quarterback with huge arm strength, well, you could look at Josh Allen and say, what if I had Josh Allen ranked, or let's give another example of a player that would be a good example of that. Let's see here. Let's say, well, yeah, let's say if Josh Allen were like ranked in a reserve ca caliber platform accuracy, um, but he has a huge arm and you think, well, that should be a bonus because once he gets his accuracy there, he's going to be have a wider range and he, he could be a star in this league. Well, to me, you know, projecting performance is a lot like um, giving a loan because it's not something that it's not something that's guaranteed that it's going to be paid in what you're giving. You know, you're giving something that doesn't exist really. So they have to have some collateral to to, to bring to the table. And even then, I'm not going to have a guy ranked here and give him this much value points over here at star level because he, even though I can see the path where that may happen, there's too much of a gap for of technical skills to learn. So usually a player may earn enough points to be bumped up to the top end of his next tier. And that's about it. And that's a conservative estimate. But I don't want to get too enthusiastic about 
awarding points in a level where it's like suddenly I've got players ranked second overall who if you took away their points, they would be like 50th, you know? And instead, if every player has high levels of, you know, projection, if they, every every player, if a player like say, say one player has um, a projectable bonus at every category, they're still going to probably be bumped up about eight to 10 points on my depth of talent. And that's pretty, that's a pretty hefty amount. So, and I only do it if I think the fixes are easy enough and that's still a, a pretty big difference. So that's a little bit of an explanation of that. Um, you know, then I go, so I, you know, I go through all those different things and you get some idea from, you know, ranging from this to decision-making, you know, and again, things are stack ranked there and you can see, you know, how I've rated them. And you, again, you can go to the glossary to get a, more of a definition if you want to. And then I go through things like, football intelligence, who I think are the better pocket passers, who I think would be good fits for West Coast offenses, spread offenses, who has a good vertical game, who I think is overrated or underrated, or or who, who are players that I think could be talented enough to develop and the starters are high-end backups with a little bit of work. Um, I talk about why I don't like rankings, um, but I, we do them anyway and how that happens, and I, I explain that a little bit more. Again, I go into the depth of talent scale, which is how I rank these players. And, you know, instead of, you know, like the NFL, one of the things that they do is they have like a zero through nine ranking. And then they just give like a short definition of what each of these things are. But what they didn't do is they don't have a whole glossary of information that defines every single skill that they're grading and how that adds up to that that number because they don't have anything that adds up to their number. They just assign a number and they write down what they've seen and go, he's a nine player. And you're like, there's a whole lot of variation there because someone who's like, you know, 25 years into the gig knows a lot more about football than someone who's like, you know, been a, a graduate assistant at a college and finally becomes a scout eight years later. And they're in their late twenties. There's a huge gap in understanding what that is. And no one's on the same page. So you're not really, and they don't design it in enough detail for you to understand what contributes to their overall score. I've shown you broken down, even in this book, each of the points that I study, what the point values are for, how they're defined, and how they add up to these numbers. So they're just taking these numbers and saying, it's like an employee evaluation where it's like from zero to zero to five. And we everybody knows if you've worked in corporate America for about five to 10 years, you know that nobody gets a low score unless they're about to get fired and nobody's going to get the highest score unless they're about to get promoted. And you usually had to ask your boss's boss if it's okay to give someone that high of a score and to justify it um, or else you're going to be questioned about your uh, about it. And they may even come back and say, you need to change that grade or you need to redo your evaluations. And I've seen that happen in, in companies. So, you know, this is a little bit more based again on some best practices that I learned over the years. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of explain what that's all about. And then I have profiles for you. And when you look at the profiles, you can see that next to each name is a plus sign. You click on that. And I literally have a grade sheet for what I've watched for at least three to four of the, you know, maybe the nine or 10 games that I've done. And for a lot of those games, it used to be back in the day that I would, grade point by point what I saw with that player. So if we go down here, I'm sure there's a couple where you'll see where there's a lot of writing here for just one game. And that's just me actually doing play by play transcription, which I'm getting away from because it, it's fairly, you know, it's just raw notes, but you see how I arrived at the scores that I arrived at for that player. And then, but also I just have a chat part of the chapter that are profiles and I talk about dynasty football and, and what my advice are about quarterbacks. You know, I give you, you know, what I think about the player and I give you a, a pretty lengthy write up about what I saw and it's distilled from all those reports that I did to give you an idea about who that player is. And then I link to some of the work that I've done. Sometimes I'll link to just YouTube highlights about or a cut up of a game from the player and I'll give you some pre-draft fantasy football advice 
about the player. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to what I think about how to go about, you know, looking at this player in context of your fantasy drafts. So that's basically what I do for each of the chapters. And, you know, and so it's about a 430, 440 page book. And then you add in all these grade sheets that I showed you with that play by play detail. And that's why it's this bloated 1700 number. But I want you to understand how I go about my process and what's involved behind it so that when you read this number one, you read this 86, you read this detail, you know that I did the work and that there's an organized logical system behind it. And so that's the rookie scouting portfolio. Oh my gosh, it is a packed full of information. And I'm guessing that's not even like half the information that you have for raw notes and all the, the things that you've uh, accumulated through the time that you've been watching film, that you've been uh, writing up about the player, and then you have to decide, you know, where do they fall? And but it's very comprehensive, and that's what I appreciate about your work is that it's comprehensive. It's complex that in the way we're not looking at this as oh this great so he, this must be it. But there's so much complexity behind the evaluation process. So Matt, tell me, well, who are your uh, targeted audience with this RSP and how can people benefit the most from your guide? I know you talked a lot about the uh, the things that are in there and I really did uh, particularly one section that I do enjoy reading about it is that you give a global view of what to expect from the league and then you hone it down on how this player fit in. But uh, tell us, who are your targeted audience and how can they benefit most from your guide? Sure, I mean, I think that I have two I have about three really very well-defined target audiences. One is clearly fantasy football owners, and that includes dynasty owners and redraft owners because redraft owners, what they, what tends to happen, actually dynasty and redraft owners are interesting to me because what ends up happening is that they will, they will often say, well, when's the post draft coming out and I want to see where their fit with team is and you know would you just sell that separately and i've always said no and they're like well why not you know the 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 post draft has the most value and i'm gonna say actually it really doesn't it's the pre-draft that has the most value because not only it's because i do all the work to inform the post draft with fit but it's also because the the ugly truth about dynasty football is that most dynasty owners play it closer to redraft level than they play it to dynasty level. And it's just, it's just the normal truth because it's one to two years down the line. If you go look at waiver wires um, of dynasty leagues, you're going to find lots of second and third round picks in rookie drafts just sitting there. Chad Hansen was a guy that people were really high on with the Jets. And he's a great example of a guy who may or may not contribute down the line, but he's an example of several guys who are available on waiver wires. Kevin White's, I just picked up Kevin White on waivers on a in a in a league with a bunch of experts, you know, and part of it is because he only has one year of eligibility left in this league. But still, I picked him up for six dollars in a $160 budget league, you know, yesterday. And you know, that's an example of not having, you know, of where and that's an extreme example of not having patience. But there's a lot of leagues like that where guys like Adam Thielen sit around or, um, you know, or Laquan Treadwell gets dropped or, you know, guys bounce around who end up being pretty good. And, and you can you can usually acquire them for pennies on the dollar. So you can go to like this, you know, in 2020, you can go back to your 2018 RSB and go, you know, who are the running backs that Matt Waldman thought was underrated? Or let me look up this guy who's just starting to get some traction with his team. You know, this Boston Scott guy, he's been on three different teams, but now he's, you know, making noise in camp. Let me read about him, you know, and you can look at what I had to say about Boston Scott, you know, and what's interesting is I just recommend reading the, reading the information about the player because that will tell you more than the number of what he's ranked at to the left. Because sometimes you have a really strong class and you have a lot of different talents and talent sometimes doesn't pay off because draft status is kind of like privilege. You know, if you, the more the higher the number you have as a drafted player, the more privilege you have to get more bias from a team because they're going to. And Ryan Riddle was the guy who taught me this back in the day. He was a former NFL player. He said, listen, and he wrote about this 
call it the hidden advantage of being a high draft pick. And I, I write about it and link to it a lot still. But it's a really, you think about this privilege and it's like when you're drafted early, teams literally think, well, when he screws up in practice or in training camp, they're like, he just needs more reps. He'll be fine. The same player, the same position, at the same position, a player who's in the seventh round, who's seen as a camp body or an undrafted free agent, he could make fewer mistakes, but he has fewer reps. So when he makes one mistake, you, you know, out of three reps he gets that day, the, they're going to see he can't play. Whereas the other player could make could make four mistakes out of 10 reps and have a higher rate of mistakes on the same reps. And because he's a first or second round pick, they're like, it's okay. He's just going to get, he'll need to get better. And it's based it's based on the bias of that, you know, they're paying one a lot more money and they've invested more and the other they didn't. And so they let him go because he didn't, and he didn't get a lot of reps. And there's a lot of players that we've seen in the past, you know, ranging from Priest Holmes to, you know, Joyk Bell to Spencer Ware, who have shown that, you know, over and over and over again, that, you know, they just needed more time. So maybe a guy like Boston Scott, you can get off your waiver wire and see how he compares. Um, I would recommend in terms of how to use this, look at the depth of talent score more than the ranking. You know, I have I remember having David Johnson as a, I want to say, outside my top eight running backs when he came out. But what I wrote down in this section was David Johnson could be a Pro Bowl player. He could be one of the best running backs in this class. He's just a little raw. He needs to learn how to run better between the tackles. He'd be, but he would be an instantly good fit in a gap scheme. And the teams that I think would be a good match for him if to where he could get that type of fit would either be Indianapolis or Arizona. And if you look at that and look at his, you know, that what he can do as a gap scheme player, if you fit him there, you're going to see him closer to that higher end of what his skill set is able to do. Now, if you just look at my rankings, you'd go, Matt Wallman ranked him ninth or 10th. Ah, you know, he's not, he, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But if you read what I'm writing about the player, you go, Matt Waldman thinks this guy could be one of the best running backs in this class. He just doesn't have him rated high because right now what he does, he, he needs to learn these things and he doesn't think he's going to make likely make an instant impact at that starter level of talent. Well, he did. And I was wrong about that, but he did it at the end of the year. And they still had Chris Johnson in there because Chris Johnson was better between the tackles. And that was even mentioned heading into the next year that they weren't so sure that you know, they wanted to wait to see how David Johnson was going to get better. And David Johnson credited Chris Johnson. He said, I didn't know how to run between the tackles as well as I needed to. And I needed to learn a little bit more patience on how to do that. In the second year, he went off. But that's the kind of thing that you know you can get out of this is that if you take the time to read some of the information, you're going to get a better grasp of who that player is. So I always recommend now it's this number to the right of the name that you want to look at more than the number to the left of the name. Um, so that's one thing that I would recommend. It's great for waiver wires. It's great for looking at potential trades um, two to three years down the line. And when you're drafting, it's also good that to look at the numbers and realize, okay, if the difference between you know, let's, here's a good example. Let's go up here and look at a player like Sony Michelle. I have him rated at an 85.9. If the difference between him and Saquon Barkley is 88.25, that's not much of a difference when you think of the grade values on my scale. You know, are you, it's one thing. And really that one thing, that as you would read this, would likely be that he doesn't protect the ball very well, Sony Michelle. If he shores that up, you've got a top talent. You already have a top talent, but you're going to have a guy who's even, you know, in, in the elite level of everybody else. So, you know, you can look at this and say, okay, do what uh, you can make your own decisions off of this a lot of times because you can look at this and say, okay, where does he fit? How good is he? What is What are his shortcomings and how likely are those things going to be something that I think he can work out and, and grow from? And if he grows from it, you know, he might be higher up on this ranking. So am I really, you know, am I going to stress over this number that he's five? Or do I believe that he's going to shore up his ball security? And if you believe that ball security is something that he's going to shore up, you want to grab him later, I'm not going to argue with you about those types of things. So you can kind of 
look at the grading scale and kind of have an idea about how to use things from that level. Um, at least, you know, two, three years down the line, it's even better because of the fact that you get all this detail. Um, and then you also get, you know, you get sheets to see this in a different way. Like for instance, you get a, a rankings table and you can see I have Nick Chubb rated one in this particular um, class. And you can see it's very, it's very small, the difference. Um, and then I give you some basic skills and you can see what my commentary is, but you can start looking at my rankings and start to see where the differences are. And we'll look at quarterbacks because that's the one that I kind of showed a little bit more and I'll, I will keep it to that chapter a little bit so that we don't go too far into some of this, but like, um, let's see, quarterback. Yeah. Click that off here go back to the chapter and you have a rankings table and you can see that, you know, I have Josh Rosen, you know, at, at his score here, whereas depth of talent, 86. That's a pretty healthy gap between him and Lamar Jackson at 82. But then there's a smaller gap between he and Sam Darnold and then a bigger gap between he and Baker Mayfield. Now, if you look at the scores and how they relate and you don't see the the, the key, even so, Baker Mayfield is still rated as a contributor level talent. And that means that, yeah, if he finds the right system right now, this year, he could be productive. Now, that may it may mean a more specialized fit. Darnold's on the border of that. You know, he's kind of on the border of that. Lamar Jackson's still on the border of that, but a little bit higher. You know, someone who I think is a little bit better than people expect. Rosen, I think, regardless of the system, he's going to be good. It may take, you know, there's going to be adjustments here and there, but overall, and I give you comparisons with the, with players stylistically, what I think their potential is. And so you can kind of use these cheat sheets to kind of get a good overview of what I'm talking about. You can use the profiles for a more in-depth look of what I said about the player. Um, and then you get three-year rankings. And I show you who I've ranked over the past three years. And I don't change the, the ranking of the past players. I want you to see what I said about them at that time. Even if I maybe my views changed over time, I still want you to see where I put them based on pre-draft as a comparison. You can see my top ranked player was Patrick Mahomes and by a pretty healthy, well, not a healthy margin. I had Jared Goff too, which a lot of people would have said, you know, this time last year, you, you know, again, especially dynasty owners, they would have been like, ah, he's, he's a bust. And you're thinking, well, you're playing it like a redraft because, you just never know. And here we go. Jeff Fisher's gone. Shaw and Bay's in. They, you know, they get an upgrade the offensive line. Robert Woods comes in. Next thing you know, Jared Goff's a Pro Bowl caliber quarterback. Um, and you're looking at, you know, here you are, year two. Look back on this. And I have Mahomes and Goff and Josh Rosen as my top three. And I give you, you know, my my three-year rankings in every RSP now since 2016. Um, or 2017, I think was the first year I did this. Um, but I'll be doing this, you know, moving forward that you get a chance to see who these guys are and how they're ranked at every position. So, you know, you get a way to kind of a dynasty angle, you get an angle of for redraft or, um, or even, or any type of league from this standpoint. And if you're, you know, if you're not a dynasty player and you're just, you're a, a draft analyst or, a a, write, a football writer, you're going to get a lot of information to be able to look at about these players, which is why I have, you know, scouts who buy the work. It's why I have, you know, why I had somebody at an, at an SEC school tell me they got a job watching RSP film rooms. And they were told that they knew they learned that they, they were told that they were more impressed with him than any non-football person they've had because of his knowledge of the game and he and he said he was talking to scouts at the combine who were like they watch my stuff regularly. So, you know, you get you're getting football based knowledge here um, that's a little outside the box, but they use as a way of reading and you know checking out some information. Some learn some things. Some find it as a way to cross check what they they've done um, and just kind of get a different take on it. Um, and you know, so you're going to get some you know from a skill player perspective if you're you're just a diehard fan, you're going to learn a lot about these players and learn some interesting things about the league. No, oh, that's fantastic. That is a lot of information. I'm even learning how to use it and going back uh, to the old RSP and 
Um, that discussion of breadth of talent score was really helpful. Um, I'm sure a lot of people, like you mentioned, stresses so much about that number far to the left. That's how it's ranked, but there's so much in there. And you're right. Um, you validated some of my points. I had the same concern about David Johnson, but um, you know that part I didn't pay as much attention to, and now I can know why. I can always go back. Your writing's there. It, it's you can always cross check it, and I like that you hold yourself accountable as well as others. People can hold you accountable as well. But um, outside of that, this is a fantastic guide. So many people, you can find so many uses for it. I'm excited to use it. We are a week away from the draft, and I am ready to have this right in front of me as we go through the draft weekend. Um, it's been fun, Matt, to have you here uh, sharing about your work, um, sharing about you know your process and how you put those together. So if you can reiterate for our audience, um, what is where can they find this RSP? Uh, what's the cost and you know, I'll post those in the YouTube description as well. Sure. You know, you can go to www.mattwaldman.com. And when you go there, basically you're going to, you know, I'll share it here. I mean, you can, you can go online here and it'll just take, give you instructions about how to sign up. You'll pay by PayPal. It's available for $21.95. I have an early bird period, but the regular price is twenty one ninety five. That early bird period is, you know, early winter <laughs> when I do that. Um, when you download, um, basically you'll click on a link and it'll take you to a folder once you've paid that you have given access to, and you'll click it and you'll download the RSP from there. Um, so it's available for twenty one ninety five. You'll get a post draft that um, we can talk about another time if you'd like. We can do that. That I'll, and I'll give a tour of that at some point, but there's a video that you can you, that you can check out, um, a video tour that you can look at the post draft right now on this page and see what that looks like, and it'll take you to a YouTube channel that basically takes you through you know the RSP and the post draft and what it looks like, um, and some of the analysis that I do from there, um, and then. Basically, that is, I usually email everyone when that's available. It's usually, I try and make sure it's no later than seven days from the draft. Sometimes I I send it out a little earlier. Usually I do. Um, And sometimes I'll even send some basic information. Last year I sent out to all my my subscribers who um, just a a basic ranking like three days later and said, this is going to change. But if you have drafts right now, you're going to have at least a little something. So I may do that again, depending on, you know how things are going, um, but that's how you can download it. Ten percent of the RSP goes to um, Darkness to Light. I've been doing that since um, 2012, um, and basically, Darkness to Light is an organization that um, prov- helps people. Basically, let me find the site here. I've got it actually. Where where is the site that we can find here? Darkness to Light. Let's do that. I might have it pulled up myself. Darkness to light is darkness to light is basically empowering adults to prevent sexual abuse, um, and so basically they provide evidence informed training um, to influence behavior train um, change, and that goes to classrooms, individual classes, um, you know, the corporations, fire departments, municipal groups, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, and so they provide a lot of good information. This is child abuse prevention month. Um, so that's, you know, that's, it's a good way to be able to get a chance to promote this this year. Um, but I've been doing this since around 2012 when the Penn state scandal broke out, um, you know, and been giving back since then. And it's a terrific organization. As you can see, the, the link I clicked was to charity navigator. So you can kind of get an idea of what their financials are and what they've been doing. And they're pretty darn good in that on that level. So you can learn a little bit more about them that way, or you can just know that you're giving to a good cause, um, you know, based on buying the RSP and doing something that you enjoy. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Matt, for uh, sharing that as well. I can attest to the darkness to light because our organization is affiliated with us as well, uh, where I work. And it is a superb organization that does great work, uh, especially here in the Birmingham, Alabama area as well. Um, thank you so much, Matt. Uh, definitely uh, would invite you back. The post-draft RSP is uh, just as good as the pre, uh, pre-draft. I can 
give you a little teaser. This is how I found out about Tyrell Williams. This is how I found out about Spencer Ware before every, anyone else. And so you guys have a fantastic resource at your disposal and all of this for just $21.99. And if you stay with us um, early winter, you'll get a, an early bird discount. Um, and let's do one. Let's do one other thing. If you want, I, I have an R, I have a guy who uh, a subscriber who wanted to give away RSPs and he bought three of them and I've given away a couple of them already. Um, just wondering if, you know, maybe we could do a contest for um, for this podcast or, or something else that you want to do. And how about you do a contest and I'll give and I'll give away the um, an RSP subscription to the winner. Awesome. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. Yes, I will post this. I will come up with a contest. We'll figure it out sometime before the draft and we'll get to it. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. It's my pleasure. My pleasure. Right. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you so much. You can find me at FF Dynasty 101. You can look out for the contest. I'll post that uh, perhaps sometime this weekend. Uh, Matt, they can find you at, uh, at Matt Wallman RSP on Twitter. Uh, anywhere else they can find uh, your work. Yep, you can find me at Matt Waldman at, at on Twitter, and you can find me at mattwaldmanrsp.com for my site. Um, as far as just all my, you know, all my, um, you know, content and information, and there's a link to mattwaldman.com to buy the work. And you can also find me at the RSP Film Room on YouTube, which will give you a lot of just straight video content that's available there. Awesome. Awesome. You'll find us all in the YouTube link of this video. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. And uh, have a good day, everyone.